Go ahead and uh, be seated. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, with this being Labor Day weekend, many people are taking significant advantage to some time off, and God bless them in that. Um, you know we need time off from time to time, right? Um, sometimes for me, I have to confess, time off is more exhausting than time on. Um, because I'm a creature of habit and routine. For those who know me on a daily basis, they know my routine. They know what time I'm going to drive to this place and what time I'm going to drive to that place and what time I'm going to get a cup of coffee and what time I'm going to be in my... I'm definitely a person of routine. And so sometimes getting away and being is actually more exhausting for me because it takes me out of my routine. Um... But we do, we bless them in that. Uh, Jason, I wanna, I was gonna say this earlier, but uh, I, I relented, but I'm gonna say it now. So what you were sharing earlier about all of this stuff going on, um, that, you know, it's almost two years since you've had this new job. I think I remember talking to you about it over four years ago, maybe even longer, um, that you basically interviewed for a job but yet you told them that the job description that you needed to fill was the one that you currently have or something along those lines. It was definitely. Cl so you've been actually, the Lord's been preparing you for this for much longer. And so I want you to know that it doesn't matter who's coming to highlight it or to show it, but the Lord has, has been positioning you for quite some time and preparing you to be there. Um, so and and the city and the city has been waiting for you to be in the spot you were at everything up until that point has been walking through the wilderness and and right now you you were like um you were at that point with Joshua when it when you had to put their had to put their feet in the water in order for the water to sit back that's kind of where you're at and you're putting your feet in your in the water because you you want to honor the Lord and the people that you work for um, because that's your character, and the Lord's going to honor that and bless that, and He's going to do more, uh, more than what you've imagined. Um, and and the work that you're doing there is going to be much more than governmental, and it's going to be much more than utility and internet. It's it's going to it's going to make way for generations and and people to step into new degrees of prosperity and um, success an opportunity that they would have never had before because of the work that you're doing now. It's like you're paving, a, uh, you're, you're um, taking an old bumpy road and you're, and you're part of a, um, a team that is turning it into a six lane highway that's going to give many, many more people opportunity. So we bless that. Um, so the last several weeks, not last week, I, um, but the last several weeks before that, four weeks before, um, I started a, a sermon series entitled The Garden Life. And um, it's been something that's been rolling around with me for at least two years before I ever shared it publicly. Um, I've shared it in some small groups. And... Um, and tonight I'm going to kind of wrap it up in what it means, what the garden life means. Um, if you were not here for those messages, I would encourage you to go back to our website, mortallifeministries.com, and watch those uh, so that you have some context. But, you know, it all boils back to the idea that in Genesis 1, it says in verse 26 and 27 and 28, right in that little area, it's God is talking to himself because he's three parts talking to one another. And he says, let us make man, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. And right after that, he begins to talk about a man, humanity, that has been created in his image and in his likeness, what their purpose on this earth would be. And the, their purpose on this earth is to, as a, as a, uh, representation of his likeness to take dominion over the earth. 
Okay, this is what it says if you if you want to read it. And then and and so what you have to understand is the, this humanity is placed in this garden, this garden of Eden, and the and the the word Eden um, translated means the paradise and pleasure. So it's this garden of pleasure. And so what we have to then begin to conclude is the rest of the world did not look like the garden. Why would humanity be tasked with being fruitful, multiplying, and then having dominion over a place that's exactly like the garden? So I propose that the world that they lived in was chaotic. That it was chaotic and it was chaos. And as, as Adam and Eve and humanity multiplied, they would multiply the garden with them as they subdued the earth. But we know, we know that there was this whole episode of Adam and Eve rebelling and falling and uh, falling into temptation. And there's several issues with that whole story. The first issue is, is um, the, the serpent tempted them with something that they already had. Think about this for a second. The serpent tempted them with something that they already had. He said that, he says, basically, this is, this is his, his temptation. He says, listen, God does not want you to eat from that tree because if you do, you will be like him. Well, my Bible says that God created man in his image and his likeness. So humanity was already like God. And so from that point, from that point of the fall, right, what we see is it, at the end of Genesis chapter 2, we see a description of humanity and the current state of their life. They're described as being naked and not afraid, like the TV show. They were naked and unashamed. And this is the state that humanity was created in. But when sin entered the world, shame entered the world. Brokenness entered the world because the very thing that they were created to function in and through was, was broken in their lives. However, if you be begin to read Genesis chapter 3 to the end of Revelation, you will discover that the entire God and humanity story is to restore humanity back to Genesis 1 and 2. That's the whole, that's the whole point of the story. So that we would, could be naked now in spirit. Please. This isn't Sunnier Palms. The nudist colony. You know there's a nudist colony right down the road. I've been there. Twice. Let me just say something. If you're wondering, it's been many, many years. But it is definitely not the place where the pretty people hang out. I'm just going to leave it at that. Mm. And so the entire God story was to restore humanity to this place of image and likeness. To where it wasn't just our image as far as, um, or, or a likeness that was broken, but it was this relationship of being able to be unashamed before the Lord. Be able to be vulnerable and completely exposed before him. And, and what happens is when the fall came, that likeness was kind of distorted and it was kind of broken off of us. And, and, and what, we, what we looked at the la two weeks after that, we looked at really, I probably was more teachy than I typically am. But to theologically understand what the image and likeness of God really means for humanity. The fact that God created humanity different than every other 
every other aspect of creation, and, and we are given a purpose to rule and to reign as we represent him. And it's important for us to understand and to think about humanity theologically, because oftentimes we think about humanity, I find myself, especially in the world we live in today, where, where it's like everything is in chaos. I look at humanity for how they're contributing to the chaos of the world that I live in. Am I the only one that looks at humanity that way right now? You know, you got it all over the place. All you have to do is turn on the news and, and you're going to see the newscasters trying to convince you that you need to hate this group of people for this reason and that group of people for this reason, this group of people for this reason, you know, and then, and then you're watching the, interna the international scene and what's going on in, in Afghanistan right now and it's complete chaos. I mean, I'm not encouraging us to hate any group of people, but the ones that I'm closest to are the newscasters because they're just creating chaos right? And the world is full of chaos. But because we're not, because we don't think about humanity theologically, we look at what humanity isn't rather than what they are. And so recently in my house, I have been starting to use this phrase that I am choosing to not trip over who people aren't so that I can encounter and deal with who they are. And when we begin to think theologically about humanity, there's this understanding that we have to come to that humanity as God's greatest and most favorite creation in all of creation, it's the one that he put his likeness and image upon and in. Um, when we begin to consider humanity, we cannot get stuck on the things that the person isn't because we're all of us are missing something right but i know this that if you're in christ i honor and fear the christ in you and if you're not in christ my heart would be that you would be in christ and if i stumble over who you aren't i can never love you into who you are and then I stepped into this little thing where we went from the Garden of Eden. We, I taught you on understanding the image and likeness of God in humanity. And then I featured another garden because if we're talking about the garden life, we have to understand that there's three significant gardens in the scripture. The Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane is the Garden of Suffering. And it is not a realistic expectation for any Christ follower to come to this place to think that their walk with God is that I'm going to come into relationship with God and all my problems will go away. Because the, the scriptures clearly communicate that if I come to Christ, I am going to suffer not because of my stupid decisions alone, because I create enough suffering for myself. But I am going to suffer simply because the name of Christ has been attached to my name. Suffering is going to come simply as a byproduct of being a bearer of the image and likeness of God. And I think it is the most ridiculous gospel to say, come to Christ and everything will be better. When you read the Bible, it clearly says if you come to Christ, you are going to join him. You have a new identity, but suffering is a byproduct of it. Isn't that a great way to win people to Jesus? But it's true. This is what the scripture teaches. And we, and we have to consider the world that we live in. We have this tendency to consider that the gospel and the kingdom of heaven is American. It's not. It's not. We have to put our, pull ourselves back and begin to say, what's going on with Christians in Afghanistan and in Pakistan and in Syria and Iran? You know, before all of this stuff happened a week ago in Afghanistan, you understand that the Afghan church is the second fastest growing church in the world. 
And they're killing Christians, even when our military was present. Now, you remember a few weeks ago, I told you to watch September 1st that something big was going to happen. You remember that? And I believe that something still is going to happen very soon, within the next week. I don't know what, so watch and listen. So do those people who are suffering for the name of Christ, do they not believe the gospel? Do they not have enough faith? I believe they have more faith because they step into this place of faith knowing that their life could be taken because of the name that they now bear. And then there's a third significant garden in the scripture. And we're going to start to look at this garden. And it, it isn't actually even mentioned, but it exists. In John chapter 20, after the crucifixion of Jesus, it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, Mr. Humble himself, the one whom Jesus loved, that would be John, and said to them, They have taken the Lord, and we do not know where they had laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. <laughs> I can't even read that. Think about how he just brags about himself. Jesus loves me more, and I'm faster. <laughs> it's so crazy. And reached the tomb first. Stooping to look in, he saw that the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter came following him and went in the tomb. And when the linen cloths lying there and, fate, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded in a, nice, in a place by itself, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. So the, the third and possibly most significant, it depends on your perspective, third significant garden in the scripture is the garden in which the tomb was placed. The garden and where the tomb was, we see this story where, where Mary Magdalene on, on the first day of the week was going to the tomb so that she could care for the remains of Jesus. And when she gets there, the stone is rolled away and she has no idea what's going on. She assumes that his body had been stolen. And I want you to look, I want you to look at this. This is so interesting. In verse 8, it says, Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. And he saw, and what did he do? Believe. See, there is, this, there is this common thought process in the church, especially the American church, that says, um, if you need to see something to believe, you don't have faith. Why would that be true? John had to see the empty tomb and the linens on the thing and the face cloth folded. And when he saw it, a man that walked with him for three years, obviously he thought Jesus loved him. He was pretty secure in that. He, he saw this, and that's when he believed. And Jesus, Jesus said it himself. He says, you know, if you don't see signs and wonders, you won't believe. See, what we do in the, in the American church, especially if, you're, if you have a cessationist background, meaning that you believe that the miraculous things of God ceased with the apostolic age, you read that, that, you read that passage of Scripture like this. Well, you know, if you don't see signs and wonders, you'll never believe. But I believe Jesus said it like this. You know, 
If you don't see signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. There is a direct connection. This is a side a rabbit trail, so I'm going to shoot it here in a second. But there is a direct connection between seeing and believing. Don't ever, don't ever run from that. Ask the Lord to show you. Ask the Lord to show you more so you can believe more. And so the third and significant garden is the garden that housed the tomb. And it's the place where, where, where those who followed Jesus the closest came to the realization and the revelation that the tomb did no longer hold the body of Jesus. It's the place when they realized that the gospel of the kingdom was not just for when they followed Jesus around for three years and cast out demons and raised the dead and healed the sick. It was the thing when they realized the one that we watched and the one that we walked with, the one that we followed, death cannot hold him. The tomb cannot hold him. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. Because here's the deal. We can preach cross, uh, Christ crucified all day long. But what I see in this passage of Scripture, John believed when he realized he was Christ resurrected. Because, see, here's the issue. Here's the issue is we, we consider the gospel too often as a thing that frees us from sin so that we will have eternal life. That's great. I like it. I'm a fan. I want it. I got it. But it isn't the purpose you were created for. It wasn't isn't, never will be the purpose that we were created for because it all goes back to Genesis 1 and 2. Listen, the gospel is there. This is the gospel. The gospel is in Genesis 1 and 2 when he says, I will create man in my image and in our likeness and they will have dominion over the earth and the creatures and all of the things associated with it. That is the gospel. And so what happens is the, the disciples and Mary discover that Jesus is, that death cannot hold him and that he is not in the grave and that he is such a gentleman, he actually folds his linens before he gets up. Think about that for just a moment. And all of a sudden, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Go wherever you go and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom is at hand. This, is what, this was their message. This is what they taught. And it all goes back to Genesis 1 and 2. And, and all of a sudden, it becomes alive to them because they realize death is not going to contain him. The one that they walked with, the one that they mourned over for three days, they realize he is not there. And this thing that says death can't hold him and everything that he taught about the kingdom when he said the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a buried treasure in a field and goes and sells everything he has to bring and to come and buy that field. They realize he wasn't talking about avoiding hell to be in heaven. He said that kingdom, that treasure is that I can join God at work and have dominion over the earth as I represent him because my image and my likeness have been restored to his. That's the kingdom. And so what does this look like for us? So I have a few scriptures here I want to I want to kind of pull out and I'm probably going to chase a handful of rabbits along the way. We have rabbits where we live. Lots of rabbits. Lots of cats. But we do chase the rabbits. My daughters love it. We'll get on our golf cart and chase the rabbits. And they're faster than my golf cart. And Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Now, 
what does he just say? I'm going I'm to give you another way of looking at that. Do you not know all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into the garden of suffering? Death. Right? The garden of suffering is where Jesus was preparing for death. The garden of Gethsemane. We were buried there with him by the baptism of death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in the newness of life. So, so you have to understand what this gospel is saying. This gospel is saying that you enter the garden of suffering, you enter the tomb, you enter the, the grave with Jesus, but just like him as he is raised, there are no linens holding you down either. You are resurrected just like he's been resurrected. And it's so interesting because I forget the name of the sermon series Pastor Rick did uh, several weeks ago, but I think it had something to do with the cross, right? What was it called? The cross of Christ. And he, and he made sure we understood that when, when you were raised with Christ, that it happened 1,000 991 years ago. Your resurrection with Christ actually did not happen the day you got saved. It happened the day he resurrected. And from that point, he's been calling us into the future from the future. Because if you let, remember what I talked about in the first week of this series, is if you look at the garden in Genesis 1 and 2, and go to the very last book, Revelation 22, there's another garden. And it's in the new earth, the new Jerusalem. There's rivers just like in the Garden of Eden. There's a tree of life that produces the same exact fruit, but a different one every month, actually. But it's the same idea that the Lord has always been calling us into the future. And so, and so when, when what happens is, is the Lord has raised us from the dead... You are, if you were in Christ, you were raised from the dead. The, the grave cannot hold you. And that is, why, that is why those that are in the persecuted church that have to make a decision between Christ and death, they're not afraid of that because they've already been raised from the dead. Well, but Pastor Lee, what about the fact that if uh, somebody doesn't give their life? Listen, he's made a way. He's made a way. And the moment that you give your life to Christ, what happens is you enter into what he's already done. You understand? Everybody with me? And so also in, in Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are nothing compared with the glory that is being revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longings for the revealing of the sons of God. I want to read that again because I get excited. I, I'm, I, I, I'm getting excited about this because let's think about this. For the creation, now that's all of creation. That's humanity, the animals, the earth, all of creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of, for the, of the sons of God. Now, who's the sons of God? The sons of God are all of those that have been buried with him in his baptism and raised with him. We're the sons of God. So, so let's think about this. For the creation waits for eager long, with eager longing for the revealing of us who are sons of God. The creation has been waiting eagerly for us to step into our identity as sons of God. So that we will be well, that so that we will exercise the dominion that God gave humanity in the garden so that we can restore the broken world back to that state. For the creation was subjected to futility not willingly, but because of him who subjected it 
in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. And look at this in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Why until now? Until now, because it's been waiting for the sons of God. Now is your time. Now is my time. Now is our time. As we said, we step into this thing and, and it's, it's that creation has been waiting eagerly for, for the sons of God to reveal the glory of God. And Paul is saying that the glory of God is now being revealed now that the world, that the earth no longer has to wait eagerly because we're here. We're here. The world no longer has to groan with the pains of childbirth because we are the carriers of the image and the likeness of God. And we carry his dominion and we are commissioned and called to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And it's so amazing because what we have to understand, what we have to understand is, is the Lord, if we're buried with him in death, raised with him in life, right? Death, resurrection. And the Bible says this in Romans chapter, a little further down in Romans 8, it, it, it says that, I'm going to skip down to verse 34 just for the sake of time. It says that who is at the right hand of God? Or let me back up. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Now, what did we read in Romans 6? That we've been raised with him. So if he raised, we raised. Right? And then this, this tells you where he's at who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us, right? And so there's this passage of scripture that says, wait a minute, Christ who died was raised, but then we also learn that we raised with him because we died with him. So he's seated at the right hand of the father interceding on our behalf, right? And then in Ephesians 2, Paul again writes, he says, but God rich in his mercy, because of the great love with which he has for us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. Dead in sin. Raised us from the dead. Made us alive. Together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him. Look at this. This is this thing where this is, you, ha you have to see this. When, when Jesus was raised in the tomb, you were there. This isn't a thing that it's like symbolic. You were there. You don't know it. You don't remember it. But in the, in the spirit realm, you were there. And you were dead in that place. And you were raised. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so there's this thing, you have to understand, dead with him, created in his image, created in his likeness from the very beginning with the purpose and plan to take the world that we live in and restore it to the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. The culture of heaven was always supposed to be spread through the earth through humanity. Always. The culture of heaven was always intended to be multiplied on earth through humanity. And so that is lost at the fall. Adam and Eve did whatever they did, caused the problem. Here we go. And then the rest of the story is to restore the state of the garden back to humanity. 
And so image and likeness are returned to humanity when we are baptized with him in his death. We are raised with him in his resurrection. And, and at that point, we are now, <clears throat> excuse me, we are now seated at the right hand of Jesus, who's at the right hand of the Father. And this was established 1,991 years ago. Because the garden tomb is the thing that restores us. The garden where the tomb is, where the resurrection power of Christ was on full display, is the thing that restores us back to that original intent of image and likeness of God. And still in Ephesians 2. This is so amazing. I'm just going to go ahead and pick it back up in verse 7. It says, so that in the coming age we might show the immeasurable riches of the grace of, of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Look at that again. So, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, but it is a gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that you may boast. Now isn't that how we live, the world we live in today? Everybody loves to boast. We were, we were visiting with our friends the other night, kind of making a joke about how people can't do anything without putting it on a public forum. You know, taking selfies, felt, fed the homeless. Imagine though, imagine if you could save yourself through your works how boastful we actually would be. But Jesus says, I saved you by grace through faith because you can't boast of the work that I did and I'm actually allowing you to join in my death and resurrection uh, for free. So put your selfie stick down Right? Put your selfie stick down. But look at what he says. This is so amazing. For we are his workmanship. Verse 10. Did I give that to you? Yeah, okay. For we are his workmanship. The Greek word there for workmanship is poema. I would spell it for you, but I don't got it in me. I probably could actually. Poema, which is the same kind of thought process as poetry. So think about this. You are God's workmanship. We are his poema. Well, let's take it back. Genesis 1, 27. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Because we are his workmanship. And what did it take to create us in his image and likeness? To speak it, the process began. Had he not spoken, the dust would have never been used. It always goes back to the beginning. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. And I love this because who was the creator? Who was the creative arm of the Trinity? Jesus. 
In the be- John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything that was created was created by Him and through Him. Well, that was Jesus. His name before it was Jesus was the Word. So look at what it says. For we are His workmanship, cre- workmanship fashioned together in His image and likeness, created in Christ Jesus, the Word, for good works. This is the same story as Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28. Because he said, let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our likeness. And what they are going to do is they are going to subdue the earth. Well, this is the same story. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus in his image and likeness. For what reason? For good works. What do you think those good works are? To subdue the earth which have been prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So this isn't the idea that subduing the earth is a thing that we have to be be burdened by that. This is an honor. This is a joy. This is a pleasure to say that all we have to do is walk in the purpose we were created to walk in, walk in the person we were created to be, because I've been created in the image and likeness of God. His very fingerprint exists in my being, exists in your being. We Death cannot hold us. The world cannot hold us. We were created to take the world and and inject the very kingdom and culture of heaven in such a way that what looks like chaos be restored to paradise. The problem is, here's the problem. Humanity has been tricked to think what they do determines who they are. If I feed the homeless more than other people, I'm more spiritual. If I serve more than other people, I'm more spiritual. And what happens is we we find ourselves not exercising and not operating in the image and likeness that have been placed in each one of us for a distinct purpose of taking dominion and subduing the earth. Because he created these things before us, before we ever existed. What does it say? What does it say? He says that which God prepared beforehand, that you should walk in them. Well, walking is not that laborious. It's just walking. And I believe, I believe right here, that right there is the number one reason you see Christian burnout. People doing things that they were not created to do. Just fulfilling good ideas. That's why, and I'm going I'm to make this very clear, that's why we don't have a million programs. Actually, we have none. Because our only focus is to to put people in a place where they encounter the presence of God and to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. I said one, but that was two. That's what we've been called to do. And when we get outside of that, And everybody has a good idea. You should do this, and you should do that, and you should do this, and you should do that. That's when you're not walking in the things that you've been created to do. That was a rabbit that kind of fit in. But what I want you to walk away with tonight is an understanding that the King of Kings... That the Lord of Lords, the one that was killed on a tree after walking through the garden of suffering, he was rejected and abandoned and and denied and abused and spat upon and, and his flesh was ripped. He was placed on a cross and publicly humiliated that that if death could not hold him 
and we are joined with him in the baptism of death that he walked through, and we are joined with him in the resurrection of life, death cannot hold us and what we've been through. Though your body may be broken, and you, and you may not take another breath in the physical, death will not hold you. And that is the garden that holds the tomb that says that when, when you think that suffering and death is the end of things, that life is right on the other side of the stone. And this life, this life is not just muddling through, barely surviving, but it's stepping into your purpose that you were created for as his workmanship that all you have to do is step into it and continue to step into it and continue to step into it. And the purpose of taking back this world for his kingdom will be, will be unveiled with every step that you take. This is why his word says things like this, that his word is a lamp unto our path, not a spotlight. Because we're to take one step at a time, and every time we take a step, on the, on the thing that we're called to walk in, what happens is we are carrying the kingdom of heaven, the culture of heaven, and we are, we are flipping it. We are flipping the upside-down world to the right-side-up uh, right kingdom of heaven. And this has to start before you can restore the garden life uh, out and about. It has to be restored inside here. Because if you're thinking and you're feeling are jacked up because you have to get your worth and your value from other things, you can never actually give it out. And so, I felt like tonight as I finished this series, That the Lord wanted me to just make space for people to encounter the kingdom. To um, be in his presence. To receive ministry, however that looks. And so... Um, What I want to ask you to do is just stand where you're at and close your eyes. I'm just going to wait on his, on him for a moment. Wait on him. Those were just, as you're standing there, if any of you 
are experiencing this specific thing. Um, is anybody experiencing like a tingling on the top back of their head? Just put your hands on your heart. I'm going to begin to pray. And if I hit certain issues, certain things that apply to you, what I want you to do is I want you to raise your hand, uh, not to show me, but to to come into agreement that the God, that the Lord is revealing things that you need to uh, either come into agreement with or to break off. So if there's anything as I begin to pray that, that hits you, just put your hand up as you're coming into agreement with the Lord. Lord, we thank you that you have, that you placed us in a garden, that you have established our feet in, in not just the garden of suffering, but the resurrection of life in that death cannot hold us, that we are not a defeated people. Um, I believe that some of that some here tonight believe that they will always be defeated, that they that they will always be in last place, that, that the Lord can't use them because they're not valuable enough to be used, that they have no purpose and no place, and that they that they feel as though they're they're, they're in the end of the line. They're always at the end of the line when when um Everybody else can go first. And the Lord says, listen, you're not at the end of the line because, you're, because you are without value. You're at the end of the line because I have put you in a place to where you can see what's going on ahead of you to see the need. Don't confuse the position that you find yourself in as a punishment, but, but understand that the position that you're in is a place for purpose. That the, Lord, that the Lord not only has put you there, but he's given you eyes to see those who are ahead of you that need a touch of his grace. And Lord says that there's some here that just feel as though that, that, that they can't really step into the, the idea that there is workmanship created for good works because they're too broken. They're just too broken. Uh, never can be put back together. Never can be made whole. Never can be given purpose. Um, and the Lord says that you can never be too broken. You can never be too broken. In fact, I don't mind broken lamps, the Lord says, because the light can shine through with more character. Holy Spirit, we invite your presence just to continue to move. You've been here. You're still here. We just yield to you. We yield to you tonight, Lord. We come into agreement that you have made us alive, that we are seated with you in heavenly places. Why don't you say that with me? Say, Lord, I agree that you have made me alive with Christ and that you have raised me up with him that I am seated with him in the heavenly places. Lord Jesus, 
I agree that I'm your workmanship to do good things that you've prepared for me just to walk in. Lord, I agree that creation has been groaning together with the pains of childbirth until you introduce me to the world because you have created me to reveal your kingdom to all of creation. Lord Jesus, I agree that death cannot hold me, that I am not afraid to die because I live, because you live. Death cannot hold me until the last thing of purpose that you have for my life has happened, death cannot touch me. I declare life over every place that my foot touches. Because the kingdom of heaven goes where I go. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, I bless every person here tonight. I bless every person that will be watching this at a later date on the Internet. I pray that, that, that your spirit will come upon them and that, that, the, that the lie that says that, that, that they are stuck is broken off of them. And they will walk in the newness of life because they have not only been baptized into your death, they've been raised with you. And that is that, that the, your image and your likeness have been restored to them so that the things that they walk in today that you created for them to do will be, will be an extension of your likeness and image flowing through them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen.